Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, Thomas Balserski, author of Bosom Friends. Thomas Belserski, author of Bosom Friends, The Intimate World of James Buchanan and William Rufus King. Now, very few historians have ever written about James Buchanan. Why did you decide to write about him? Hmm. Yes, very few. One hand, two hands, and somewhere <laughs> in between there. I, I, I think I could count him up on, on two hands. Um, James Buchanan is this sort of straw man of the antebellum period, someone on, upon whom things happen but who does not seem to have his own agency. So there's that. There is probably part of me that has a, a fan, a fandom for the lovable losers. Uh, one of my good friends growing up was a Cubs fan, and I think I absorbed <laughs> some of his tendencies. But I'm also from New Jersey originally, and being a middle stater between New York and Pennsylvania, I had my eye left and right. And so I was generally aware of where the presidents of my regions came from. And I kind of knew about Buchanan from an early age, he was a part of uh, every high school history textbook, often though one that's preceding Abraham Lincoln, the great looming shadow of American history. So when one becomes a graduate student, the imperative is find a new research topic, topic. Tell us something new about American history. And probably from those deep recesses, I have to say, that's where he may have come up. There are a lot of other reasons why I've come to, to know him, to like him even, to dislike him too, and to research him. But I have to say it probably has to do with somewhere in my upbringing, in my own biography. What are some reasons to like him? <laughs> well, again, the lovable loser. Um, if you're in the basement of American history, there's no place to go but up. That's what I say sometimes. Um, as I've come to research American history and teach it, I realize that we have a tendency in American society to want to rank, whether it be the best restaurant for this cuisine or whether it be the best US president or the greatest president. We also have a tendency to deride, to decry, saying that place is the worst. Well, we also have the worst president. And Buchanan was starting to come on my radar as this worst president character. So whether that's a reason to like him or not, I'm not sure. But it was an attractive, actually, quality because it begged the question, why? Why was he such a bad president? So um, his presidency is the focus. His presidency is what people talk about. It's what they know something about. And if you were to pick up, a, again, a history textbook, that's where he shows up as a president, fully formed, an older man, 65 years of age. But what I've come to like about him is his pre-presidency, the part before he becomes um, the commander in chief. And there are qualities about him that I think in our present day and age can be appealing. Um, we'll talk about his personal life, I'm sure, but even just the way he um, conducted his correspondence, his purview on the world. He was not an insular person. He looked globally. Um, and in fact, I would say diplomatically, he achieved his greatest successes as president. So he was a man of, his, of the world, you might say, before that was a common characteristic. He traveled overseas multiple times in his lifetime. Um, and for someone who until recently had never gone to Europe, it was actually sort of wondersome to think, here's this man I've been studying who had this whole breadth of experience, and now I'm sort of following his footsteps. Did he write a lot? that you had to, to go back to and learn about him? Buchanan is prolific. Um, when you think about the range of 19th century statesmen, Buchanan has to be up there for having produced the greatest volume of writings. Um, certainly the Adams should take a fair shot at that claim as well. Buchanan, by comparison to the Adamses, did not keep a diary. However, he was a prolific letter writer. And it's in his correspondence that we see his greatest output. He also uh, wrote many speeches, which he published or kept notes on. Um, in addition, he did write a brief autobiography of his life, which was very helpful, and he did keep one travel diary as well. Um, but again, as I say, it's in his correspondence that we find his greatest output as a writer, and I think we see him as a politician in his truest sense when, when you read his letters. Now, your book is not just about him, but it's about a gentleman by the name of William Rufus King. Why did you decide to pair the two of them yeah. together? 
William Rufus King is, by comparison to Buchanan, who we've already decided is somewhat uh, of the overlooked president and perhaps the one that um, we sort of throw to the side, he's even worse. He's a true footnote in American history. That being said, he was elected vice president. And if I recall the uh, Jeopardy daily uh, double category, uh, he was the $2,000 clue, the only man to have been elected vice president and to have taken the oath of office abroad. Um, so truly, you have to be a, a true trivia fan to know something about William Rufus King. My book is not meant to rehabilitate him so much as it is to show their relationship. Because again, with King, what's interesting about him is not his brief one month stint as vice president and his death, as much as it is his life prior to becoming vice president and particularly his relationship with Buchanan. So Buchanan is the kind of fulcrum of this book and King is in many ways is, is almost like the, the, um, the, the moon that orbits around Buchanan's uh, earth. He, he, he shows up at various times in Buchanan's life in very significant ways. Um, and I have to say, I think the book is written, therefore, sort of from the perspective of James Buchanan and how William Rufus King um, played a role in his life. Did you know much about their relationship before you started? Yeah, the relationship is much spoken of in the sense that it's much gossiped about. One thing that did bring me to the topic and brought me to this pairing in particular is the reality of our own times of that thing called the internet where um, there's, there's no one peer reviewing a blog post or a story um, that shows up on a, a popular um, site. And the two of them together as search terms, and I'm sure the viewers will want to do this, will produce some pretty incredible results. And the main thing that one finds in this, this casual searching of their names is story after story, um, supposition after supposition about a relationship and particularly a sexual relationship between them. So with that as the basis, you can imagine as a historian and as someone who is looking for a research topic, this was appealing. It had, you might say, sex appeal. Well, what was it about the two of them that caused people to think that? Yeah. There are some good reasons to speculate, and speculation as a kind of historical enterprise has produced, I think, much good research. Um, especially with the history of sexuality, for historians who, who are looking for evidence in an evidentiary record that was suppressed, destroyed, or otherwise diminished, um, there is a tendency to want to see between the lines, to read between the lines, and to find um, a through line that could connect two people together. Um, so there's that impulse, and I think it does come out of a natural historical impulse to want to find evidence of what I call a usable queer past. That all being said, probably what gives people their very initial inclination, their initial reason to make that assessment is the fact that they never married. Each man never married, and indeed when one digs just a little bit below the surface, the stories of their supposed romances are questionable and have elements that are um, to maybe the modern reader, um, you know, they raise eyebrows a little bit. And so I think because of that, two 19th century bachelors, that's the basis. And then, yes, their correspondence does survive. Evidence of it survives. Some very intimate correspondence survives. And finally, yes, they did, while in Washington, D.C., share a boarding house together for 10 years. Now, you, have, uh, you quote a May of 1844 letter where you say uh, their letters produce two of the most often quoted lines about their relationship. Quote, uh, uh, this is Buchanan writing to King. Um, I have gone a wooing to several gentlemen, but have not succeeded with any one of them. Oh, to which King replied, I am selfish enough to hope you will not be able to procure an associate who will cause you to feel no regret at our right. separation. Those are two of the quotes that... Um to, to riff off Thomas Jefferson are like the fire bells in the night to historians. They have loaded um, language of intimacy, uh, fraternal affection, one could argue romantic uh, friendship. At the same time, not, not to disparage your reading, but in fact, the first letter is from Buchanan to Cornelia Van Ness Roosevelt. And it's an important correction I'm making because people have overlooked that that letter he wrote was actually not to King. He responded to it because the circumstances were such that William Rufus King was at that time in New York City with Mrs. Roosevelt. So in fact, the correspondence was, was triangulated around this woman, Mrs. Roosevelt. So yes, the response was from King to Buchanan based on the letter. 
but it, it's, it's just, it's a detail that was, was one of the first things I found people sort of overlooked and suppose that Buchanan's words must have been addressed to King when in fact it was to a woman. Now this woman, uh, Cornelia Roosevelt, yeah. she appears periodically in your book yeah. as a friend of Buchanan. Was she related to the Roosevelt's who became president? Well, her, she was born Cornelia Van Ness, meaning that her husband is a Roosevelt. And yes, he's James Roosevelt. And yes, he is a Roosevelt of those Roosevelt's. Um, and yes, um, so you might say she, she picked a good one for a political history down the road. But James Roosevelt himself was actually a congressman. So as a congressman's, congressman's wife, Cornelia did uh, travel with James to Washington during his term. Significantly, that was a two-year term between 1841 and 1843, right in the heart of when Buchanan and King were living together. And it's that previous relationship between Buchanan and Cornelia, now Roosevelt, that brought King for the first time into that circle. Well, uh, let's back up a little bit yeah. for people who might not be entirely fresh on their James Buchanan <laughs> facts. Where was he born? Where did he grow up? Yeah, I think you're right to do that. Um, when I give talks on this subject, I always provide a brief biography of each man because getting the details straight, so to speak, early on are important. So Buchanan, we're here in Pennsylvania. It's, it's important to acknowledge him as such. Um, born in 1791 um, in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania, there is a, a small little town or designated area, Cove Gap, that he was born in. His site is a state historic park today. His actual log cabin that he was born in has been moved over to Mercersburg Academy. And between Mercersburg and Lancaster, I think there's a very friendly competition for who gets to be the most James Buchanan-esque. Um, but Buchanan did eventually leave, Lancaster, sorry, leave Mercersburg for college in Carlisle at Dickinson and then to Lancaster where he established his career. Um, he was a lawyer, a very prosperous one, successful. He had aptitude for it. He did dip his toe in politics on the state level but he, had not, he did not have a national ambition until, uh, famously, his broken engagement with Ann Coleman, his then fiance. Um, following that and her, her untimely death, that is when he entered politics. So we can date his rise to national politics to about the year 1820. Um, and from that point forward, he was either in the House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate, a presidential cabinet, a ministerial post, or the White House until, frankly, the day he left office in 1861. He was a public servant. He was sometimes called the old public functionary, old buck, a lot of colorful nicknames. But he made his living essentially in the service of the government. And he, he rose to prominence for that exact reason. You also have a nickname of him, the old humbugger. <laughs> Not mine, yes. It's another one that came up. And actually it's important to note that with a lot of the evidence that people tend to support, it's other people throwing the slang or the shade at him. It's, it's a gossip. It's, it's a gossipy kind of language. Uh, these are not uh, the kind of nicknames that he would have embraced. I think he would have been okay with Old Buck, though. Oh, speaking of gossip, while we're on the subject, <laughs> uh, his relationship with Ann Coleman yeah. and, and what led to the breakup. So Ann Coleman, I'm, I'm glad to return that because, return to that, and it seems as though she's the enigma wrapped in a riddle that, uh, given the, the, the evidence that survives, may stay that way. Um, some of the best scholarship on her is between, was, was conducted by the biographer and historian Philip Klein, whose book, President James Buchanan, is still um, the landmark book of, about Buchanan. So Klein had access to some materials that I think modern researchers don't have anymore. I've actually looked for some of his materials that he, he cites, and I can't find them. So there's that. Then there's John Updike. Now, John Updike, another Pennsylvanian, very famous. He, too has been on this program. Well, I feel honored now. Sat in the very chair you're sitting in. Okay, now I really feel honored. <laughs> no, but between Klein and Updike, the consensus that emerged about Ann Coleman and the relationship with Buchanan is that he neglected her, he was a busy lawyer, and that a miscommunication that took place between Buchanan and Ann Coleman, where he called upon another family and spent a social hour with an unmarried woman who apparently gossiped it over to Ann in spite, led to the breakup. Now, her death is the part that is actually the most controversial. Um, in some of the earliest writings about Ann Coleman, some of the gossip and some of the slander directed to Buchanan, it was argued that she committed suicide, that she took her life out of grief, out of this idea that her, her, her engagement was broken and therefore she could never marry and she was essentially um, a ruined woman. The evidence that Klein and Updike have found, and, and I, I you know, for what I could find of it, suggests that she probably died of an opiate overdose, laudanum being the drug in question, in Philadelphia. 
Um, the, the thing that is the key piece of evidence, which is, which is again, um, no longer surviving, is a diary record by a physician who did examine her. Um, and he talks of hysterical convulsions, which using that gendered patriarchal language of a doctor of the 19th century, we can only imagine what that meant. But I think we're more and more um, today in the 21st century aware of the effects of drug overdoses and our own opiate epidemic. And I, I think it's more plausible than ever that she overdosed. And despite the rumors, despite what people might think, I think that's, that's what I conclude. And uh, until I see otherwise, I'll stand by it. Now, you said he was born in 1791 That's right. during the administration of George Washington. Right. And when he got into politics, you said he was a Federalist. A Federalist, right. Some, sometimes we forget our early party system was not Democrats and Republicans, but the Federalists and a party that sprung up to oppose them. Not so much the Anti-Federalists, who were more in the constitutional period, but what will be called variously and confusingly Democrats and Republicans Thomas Jefferson's party, I call them, they call themselves the Democratic Republicans. So the Federalists were the dominant party of the, the era in which Buchanan was born. It was a 12-year period of Federalist administration between George Washington and John Adams. I also think that Federalism as a political party was starting to decline when Buchanan came of age. What did and, they believe in? What would Well, I was going to say, Buchanan was, in order for Buchanan to be, claim himself to be a Federalist as a young man in Pennsylvania, was almost a conservative stance. Um, by this time, it was pretty clear that they were not uh, the forward-looking party on so many levels. Um, the Federalists were, for example, against um, the War of 1812, which had popular support among a younger generation, so-called war hawks, but particularly these Democratic Republicans. That was one issue. They were, they were against the war, and in fact, famously, New England Federalists will meet in Hartford in the year 1814 and convention uh, to, to, to talk of secession. So Buchanan is attaching himself to a dying, sort of backward-looking, unpopular party. But he also, therefore, inherited those Federalist assumptions about the economy. He was pro-bank, particularly pro-national bank, as well as we might call protectionism, which is to say the tariff, another issue uh, alive in our time. So he's pro-bank, he's pro-tariff, he's anti-war. And then later he became a Jacksonian? That's right. Is that a, is that a switch or <laughs> is there a consistency there? It's an evolution, really. Um, Jacksonianism, Jacksonian democracy is a fascinating subject in its own right. And yet the connections between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, the death of the Federalists, the emergence of the so-called National Republicans, and then finally Jackson and the Jacksonian Democrats. It's a, it's a series of steps. It's a series of small steps that are really based around personality. Jacksonian democracy is aptly called because without Andrew Jackson, there could be no Jacksonian democracy. It is, we might say, a cult of personality of sorts. So knowing that General Jackson, the famed hero of the War of 1812, a kind of uh, successor in the mold of George Washington, Knowing his popularity, knowing his national standing, Buchanan seemed to be attracted almost like a magnet would be um, to the Jacksonian movement. And he begins slowly to call himself such illogical terms as, I am a uh, federal Democrat. <laughs> and then by 1824, in, in the crux of a contested election in which Jackson was involved, Buchanan is indecisive, he plays an incautious role for which Jackson blames him later, but he does stand up at that time and finally casts his lot with Jackson. And you could really trace Buchanan's evolution as a Jacksonian Democrat from that moment. And maybe to make up for past sins, he is one of the staunchest Jacksonians as he moves into the House and the Senate. And by his uh, presidency, he himself will think of his politics as old school Jacksonianism, Jacksonianism, which is itself an antiquated concept by the 1850s. How did he become a member of Congress in the first place? Yeah, so the one thing people would, would need to know about elections in this period is that um, suffrage was a kind of piecemeal operation. So when Buchanan was born, um, the only election someone who had the right to vote, which was not everyone, typically was property holding requirements that gave suffrage, was for your local legislator, on an annual basis or for the House of Representatives on a biennial basis. The suffrage will be expanded and eventually, importantly, um, the vote will be given to the people in, to elect the electors who then elect the president in the Electoral College. But still, the tradition of voting, generally we're talking about state level voting for the legislature and 
uh, House of Representatives on the national level. So Buchanan followed that exact path. He runs for one of those annual legislature positions. He builds a local base. And it so happens then, yes, when the time was right, he was then elevated to the, to the representative for Lancaster in the House of Representatives. So we're still talking very small-scale politics. In those days especially, a, a, a seat in the House um, could still be the, 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 the minimum of 30,000 people per seat as the Constitution predicted. And given that only a fraction of those people would be voters, it was very possible to truly know your electorate down to the, down to the voter. So he, he, to be elected to the PA state legislature or to the House of Representatives in those days was to be locally popular. And uh, he was elected to the U.S. House as a Democratic Republican? No, he was still a Federalist. Oh, he was. So he, that's the 1820 period. Yeah, he will become a Democrat, a Democrat, a Jacksonian Democrat, not to confuse too much, 1824. So he's got about four years as a Federalist in a party without a kind of champion in the House of Representatives. What did it mean to be a congressman when he first went to Washington? Well, for one thing, it meant to suffer privation. Um, he went to Washington five years after the devastation of the War of 1812, which brought the burning of the White House, the burning of the Capitol. And then that's just the damage done by the British Army. Washington was a work in progress. It was still very much a swamp, so to speak. The land between the Capitol and what is today uh, the Washington Monument, the National Mall, had not yet been filled in. That truly was the swamp. Um, there were limited options. And Yes, he will go and do the job of a representative, but one of the first things congressmen did was to think about where they'd live. So after he figured out that part of it, and he would live in a boarding house, he then becomes a representative of the people of Pennsylvania. In that capacity, he always took the, the point of view of being a so-called instructions man, meaning he did what the state legislature of Pennsylvania told him to do. A very safe position for a Federalist without a national party to back him up. So he, he relied on a kind of localist view of his role as a national figure in, in, in the National House of Representatives. He voted. Um, he did occasionally speak. He doesn't show up too often in the record in his early years. Again, he had very limited concerns because he did only what his constituency asked of him. So for a lot of, in a lot of ways, to be in the House of Representatives was to hold a seat, was to be truly a representative of a, a, a local um, group. How much time would he have spent in Washington? Yeah, it's a great question because it's very different from today. So again, elections are biennial for the House, um, and today we're on the, the even cycle, zero, two, four, six, eight. So yes, he would be elected very, very often. The elections took place almost a full year before you would actually go to Washington, and that has to do sometimes with the nature of when Congress met. If Congress was... In, uh, called by the president, it might meet. But if it didn't, it typically met in December of the year after you were elected. So again, elections might be held as they were in Pennsylvania early. They would be held in October. He might not show up until December. So that's the first delay. So you're now into your term for about 10 or 11 months and you have not yet done a single act as a congressman. You show up in December, then it's variable when the Congress would go into recess, but as early as May, sometimes through June or July, but that was rare. Then there's a break, and the Congress would resume again in December. And if you're keeping track of the time, um, that's already now moving into the second year of the term. And so then they would meet through what is called um, the lame duck period, which is the end of that two-year period, which would expire on Inauguration Day in March if it was a presidential election. And if the Congress was reelected, it might be asked to stay for a special session. But at the end of the day, in a 24-month period, a typical congressman was in Washington less than a year, of less, less than, fewer than 12 months of those 24. So while he was in Washington, would his day-to-day -day job been mm -hmm. at all similar to the job of a congressman today? I really don't think so. Um, Congressmen today, as I've learned from following modern politics, spend a lot of their time on the phone, can't do that. Mm -hmm. Calling for donations, can't do that. Meeting with constituents, that was rare in an era where travel was difficult and long. And generally, you know, hobnobbing. Um, and maybe that's the one thing he did have in common, was meeting with other politicians, conducting the politics of, of the Congress outside of the Congress, outside of its meeting, as well as in the Capitol. So, 
probably the, the most resemblance he had would, to a modern congressman would be the fact that he showed up in the Capitol building and spoke. But even then, of course, we know that the modern U.S. House of Representatives, that chamber is relatively new. He met in the old House chamber, the famously Echo one, where you could point down and speak to the ground and the marble acoustics would send your voice over here. So uh, even then, he, he's in now the Hall of Statuary, uh, where, he, where he would have been in those days. Uh, I don't remember seeing this in your book, but mm -hmm. do you know whether they had staffs or not? Because congressional they had staffs no are big congressional now. staff. They had no congressional None. office. They were expected to do their work either at their wooded desk right in the hall, or perhaps at the boarding house, which is one reason why in the early Republican period where Buchanan served, the boarding houses were such important, really incubators of politics. It was called a mess. Yeah, mess. I think people still hear the word mess hall and know what that means in a military context, a place where food is served and eaten. Um, and it's for that reason that the boarding house is also called a mess. It's called both. Uh, let's go back to William Rufus King a little bit. Yeah. Uh, where did he grow up? What were his politics? So I've given, the, 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 I've given Buchanan already more due than I would if I were being even here. Yes, uh, the left and the right need well, equal share. That's right. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, King is the one people often tell me they, they knew nothing about, and so I'm, I'm always happy to try to tell his story as much as I can. And he's a Southerner. Um, he's born in North Carolina. He's born five years before Buchanan in 1786. And his, his region of North Carolina, Sampson County, Clinton, North Carolina, near Fayetteville, uh, which is the transition period sort of area, I should say, the Piedmont, uh, sort of going into the upland of North Carolina, so not, not on the coast. Um, he was born into a plantation society of sorts, not a, a, of like the cotton plantations we think of, but of a mixed agriculture, a lot of uh, wheat as, as well as lumber milling. Slaveholders? And, and yes, a slave society. It's still a slave society, just not with some of the, the things that we sometimes stereotypically associate with slavery, but still agricultural. So he comes out of this slave society from really revolutionary North Carolina into early Republican North Carolina, and that's where he comes of age. He was a Democratic Republican? Yeah, so he goes to the University of North Carolina, he gets educated, and even earlier than Buchanan, King will stand for election uh, in, in North Carolina to the U.S. House. In fact, he was the youngest man elected to the U.S. House until that time, which gives you a sense of his natural political character. William Rufus King was, was gifted, I think, at, at fitting in and being well-liked um, within the social circles he ran. And so a very young man, he comes to the U.S. House of Representatives. He comes in 1811 when, again, the United States is about to enter this, this crippling war of 1812. He leaves in 1816, partly, I think, because of a, of a massive political movement against the incumbent congressman of the period who famously accepted a pay raise. And there's one thing we've learned. <laughs> you don't get typically another term if you take a pay raise. In fact, the most recent amendment to the Constitution today has to do with congressional pay. But yes, he was a Democratic Republican. He was a Jeffersonian, uh, sort of Southern Democrat, we might say, of that time. And he, too, will make the move to Jacksonian democracy. Well, when, when they, so they met as members of the House of Representatives? Not in the House, although they were in Washington together, overlapping for as many as 10 years. But King will eventually move to the Senate, but well before Buchanan, in fact, 15 years before Buchanan. He was, if nothing, um, a star of his time. Buchanan will only truly, I think, come to know King, though, when he's in the Senate. And while, I, while, it's, while it's possible they, they did know each other and met, I, I would call it, it would have been in passing. Um, at that time, yes, some senators and, and, and members of the House did live together in boarding houses. Certainly Buchanan and King did not during those 15 years of overlap or so. Um, but when we do find them finally sharing a boarding house together, it's during the Jacksonian period. It's, in, it's into the 1830s. Can you describe what a mess would have been like? Yeah, so the best way to think of it is as a kind of a townhouse or a row house. The, the Washington, D.C. at that time was famous for this federal-style architecture. Um, and so a typical street would have several of these buildings in a row. You would go up a series of steps. The first floor would have parlor, a front parlor and a back parlor. There would also be maybe the kitchen in the back or pot potentially in the basement. Um, the, the bedrooms would be on the second, third, and sometimes the fourth floor. And so there would be front and back bedrooms and probably as many as four or five bedrooms in a typical boarding house of that kind. Now, there were larger boarding houses, and there were also other kinds of 
um, establishments like hotels that we would perhaps more generally recognize. But through at least the 1840s, if not the 1850s, the majority of congressmen lived in these small communal units of between four and six. Um, some smaller, some larger, but um, Buchanan and King did follow that pattern. They, they had, in some of their early boarding houses, larger groups, but they tended to want to go smaller. It's as if they were looking to find a, a, a political connection and a personal connection with individuals from either their section or their party. And in time, King will mostly end up living with other Southerners. Buchanan will mostly be with other Northerners, particularly from Pennsylvania. But it's when they meet that the pattern changes. You list in the back of your book a lot of different addresses yeah. or, or townhouses. Were you able to go to Washington and point to some and say, that's one of them? Um, as far as I know, none of the buildings in which they live survive, which hmm. tells you something about um, urban renewal. That's a 20th century story. But um, I've walked by the addresses. Some of them have uh, storefronts on them. Some of them are residential. But they don't look like 19th century row houses. They, they lived in an area that has been widely um, rebuilt and, and has changed much since the 19th century. So no, I can't look at a physical building, but there are other examples both in the photographic archive as well as some surviving boarding houses today that give you a sense of it. And what year did James Buchanan first arrive as a congressman? So again, House of Representatives, that goes back to 1821. It's when he shows up in December of 1834 in the Senate. And that's when they, they do share a boarding house together starting then. When he arrived as a freshman mm -hmm. member of Congress, what were the issues that, uh, that were going on at the time? So as a senator and a Jacksonian now, he is basically in the second term of Andrew Jackson's presidency in which a lot of the actions already happened. Uh, some of the great conflicts and, and crises of the Jacksonian administration occur in the first and then into the second term, particularly around the tariff and the issue of nullification and the, the recharter of the bank. So Buchanan enters the Senate after all that's happened. Um, really then, he's there to kind of hold down the fort for a time. Um, he does deal with the great, not we won't call it the Great Depression, not to confuse our viewers, but to that time, the largest depression um, or panic, as we now call it, the Panic of 1837. And it was a three-year economic downturn, which um, the, the next president, Martin Van Buren, Jackson's successor, uh, attempted to manage through a number of initiatives that Buchanan and King supported while in the Senate. So they became um, spokesmen for the democratic view, the democratic orthodoxy around um, particularly the independent sub-treasury, as it was called, a way to try to, um, without working through a federal bank, instead have a, a system whereby money um, could still be deposited and be under the direct control of the federal government. That was one major thrust of what they did, particularly Buchanan. But the second one brings in the issue of slavery. And indeed, given Buchanan's um, later role in, in secession and the, the onset of the Civil War, it's very telling to see how he emerges as a senator on this issue. Um, abolition and the abolitionist movement was getting some steam by this time. In the 1830s, we are already into what one historian has called the second uh, age or, or era of abolition, and William Lloyd Garrison is now active. Um, so abolitionist petitions are starting to come into the Congress, and particularly in the Senate, a body whose rules are um, a bit, how should we say, um, more conservative than the House. Um, today, of course, we have the filibuster, which is kind of a remnant in a way of this, of this conservatism, the Senate was more likely to come up with a procedure that would allow these petitions to, while they would be acknowledged as having been accepted, not read, and therefore pushed to the side. Um, it's, been it's been described as a gag rule, and in the sense that it's gagging, like one would, um, the free speech of these petitioners. Buchanan was the one who actually originated the rule in the Senate. And he, as a, a Pennsylvanian and a Northerner, he actually had kind of the high ground here by which to say that on both behalf of his Southern senators, but also the Democratic Party in the North, um, that the only way to avoid, as he called it, everlasting debate would be to implement this gag rule. So he stands up in favor of slavery, arguably when he didn't have to. And this is perhaps the first conundrum of James Buchanan's political, if not personal, life, is why did he do it? 
and one only need think about with whom he was living and with whom he was politicking at this time, particularly William Rufus King. King at this time had already been in the Senate for almost 20 years and was becoming something of a senior statesman. He's, he's often overshadowed by the likes of Henry Clay and Daniel Webster and John Calhoun. But between the time he joined the Senate in 1819 and his death in 1853, William Rufus King was the president pro tem of the Senate more than any other man. And it was, in, it was during this debate around the issue of abolitionist petitions in the Senate where King was president pro tem that he actually left the podium and gave a speech in favor of the resolution that Buchanan was proposing. So King is backing him up in important ways and it's solidifying this cross-sectional bond over this issue of slavery. Did Buchanan, before he became a senator, write anything about his views on slavery or does his opinion evolve later on? There is some evidence to suggest that <coughs> he understood the national value of being not so much pro-slavery but sort of constitutionally committed to the right of people who hold slaves, the, ens the enslavers, slaveholders, to that property under the Constitution. Uh, there's a quote from an earlier speech where he, he uses the metaphor of a backpack, as I shall put on my backpack and go south to protect essentially the institution. Um, it was a bit highfalutin rhetoric. He had no intention. In fact, he rarely goes south. But he, I think, saw being from Lancaster, being from south central Pennsylvania, from the region that borders the Mason-Dixon line, from the Mid-Atlantic, that the political value of being a northerner who supported the institution would pay off. He is also emerging in the, Andrew, the party of Andrew Jackson, himself a slaveholder, but essentially the, 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 a core belief of the Jackson party was exactly what Buchanan believes, which is that um, there's a constitutional right to own slaves and that um, the politics have to follow that. So that's one thing. If you go into his biography, there is also this curious other part of it that Pennsylvania, while it did institute gradual emancipation, did not actually vote on outright abolition um, when it did finally get to the issue after the, the American Revolution, so that it was still legal to own slaves and then to be indenturing those, those people as free or indentured servants, really, till their freedom for a period of, I think, 20 years. So the Buchanan family actually fell into that category. They, they, they owned slaves until it was legal to do so um, in, the, in the first decade of the 19th century. And then they became indentured, and then finally they were, they were freed from that indenture. So Buchanan was raised actually by an African-American nurse named Hannah, and he had a fond recollection for her in, in, his, in some of his correspondence. So yeah, even though he's a northerner, we think of him as coming from a free state. Actually, Pennsylvania, while it did eventually abolish slavery, had these, as the many northern states, not loopholes, but gradual uh, approaches. So he, he was probably among the last generation of Pennsylvanians to have a living memory of the slave system, even in the north. Now, you mentioned that while, while uh, King and Buchanan were in the Senate, the mm -hmm. likes of Clay, Calhoun, yeah. and Webster were there. How were the two of them seen as orators? Or, like, how did right. they measure up compared to those well, others? Well, one historian has dismissed King as a backbencher, which is a pretty, dis pretty big dismissal if you think about the Senate, meaning you're in the back circle, you're not heard from. But that's a lot to do with the fact that King was president pro tem so often. And as the presiding officer of the Senate, it was really out of form to give a speech. So as a result, King doesn't have all that many uh, orations on the, in the congressional record, nor did he publish very many, if any, of his speeches. Buchanan, by contrast, did give regular prepared speeches, um, particularly on the, on the issue of the independent sub-treasury, which his biographer Klein thinks is his, his best speech as a senator. Um, they also had congressional, or I should say committee service, so they like today, senators meet in committee, and some of the most important work of legislation happens there. So they also contributed to the crafting of legislation at that time. But no, they were not the ones who got the credit, you might say, uh, as great orators. Um, they both apparently had fine speaking voices, loud enough to be heard, which was a prereq in those days to be a politician. But they weren't exactly deep thinkers either. Um, Buchanan was more of a constitutionalist, a kind of a legal approach, not so much of a kind of political orator. And King, again, given his um, stance of um, neutrality and statesmanship, 
didn't give many speeches at all. Now, you said early on Buchanan had a, a, a great resume before he became president. One of them was he was minister to Russia. That's right. The minister to Russia, um, always in the news, Russia. And Buchanan's main accomplishment there was to enact a commercial treaty um, with the Tsar, which allowed for duties on imports and exports to be set, which then regularized or normalized trade with Russia. So again, relationships with Russia, always important. What was so impressive about it was that he was the first American minister to do so in a, in a generation, and previous ones had failed. So yes, he had foreign policy experience. King, I should point out, had also gone overseas, had also gone to Russia, um, but as a secretary to the American legation. So Buchanan went as a full minister, a much um, higher rank in, in the service, whereas King was, at that time, uh, a secretary. And you, you tell a story of how it sounded like Ru William Rufus King hit on the uh, the future Tsarina at, on her wedding day? Was that You know, when right? one thinks about stories, uh, this is one of them. Um, as a historian, it was one of my favorite parts of the book was to try to uncover to what extent we can trust the evidence here. The evidence for William Rufus King's affair or interest with the Tsarina comes from family history, oral history. It also, though, shows up in his correspondence to family members, but in a kind of tangential reference. And then there are some uh, pieces of, of this evidence in correspondence to other politicians of the day, but it's more oblique and indirect. When you put the three together, what we conclude is that he certainly told the story as if it happened, but the independent evidence that one would want from other people in St. Petersburg at that time does not exist. So unfortunately, um, William Pinckney, the actual minister to Russia who was King's superior, did not comment on the circumstances of King's departure. But it is the case that King left the service a month after this so-called love interest and um, it could be for that reason that the timing worked as a story. Now, Buchanan also served as Secretary of State. That's right. For, for one president, two presidents. No, he was he was considered for Secretary of State a second time, but only served once. Um, yeah, we're now we're moving into the period of their uh, of their transatlantic separation. Of course, the name on everyone's lips, James Polk. Um, <laughs> so James Polk is elected president in 1844, and. Um, he, he actually has been given a very nice historiographic, uh, scholarly review. And Polk has, has gotten all the credit, uh, especially for his accomplishments with the Oregon boundary dispute and the prosecution of the Mexican-American War. But Buchanan was his Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State has a particularly important role in wartime uh, because he is responsible for the diplomatic uh, relations between countries, but also, therefore, the normalization of relations through a peace treaty. So Buchanan has two kind of signature contributions to the Polk presidency, and that is his managing of the Oregon boundary uh, negotiations, and then finally um, his managing of the diplomatic process that ended the war. Was Buchanan an expansionist? He did not start out as one, and it, one only might think about his early Federalist roots to see why that might have been. But Buchanan did become one. He I think embraced expansionism as a political expedient. He, you might say, became a, a proponent of manifest destiny. And again, giving him his due and, and always thinking him as a, of him as a politician, he saw the political value of expansionism and embraced it for what it was. So that by 1848, when he's making a bid for the presidency, he wanted to present himself as such, yes. So there was uh, Cuba, California, Texas, Oregon, you're actually working backwards chronologically. Mm -hmm. So Cuba, the ongoing issue, you might say gets resolved during the William McKinley presidency in the Spanish-American War. Um, so California will eventually be admitted to the Union in 1850, but with, with what is then the Mexican session, it is brought in. That's the end of the Mexican-American War. Texas, that comes in earlier uh, through the annexation um, that was acknowledged by John Tyler, so even before Polk. So yeah, so B Buchanan will... will embrace the annexation of Texas. Um, he, he comes in favor of it even before it passes. He will eventually come to, to push for the, um, the Mexican session. California's admission is an interesting question. It's part, as a, part of what, as I say, the Compromise of 1850. Um, the big issue there was the extension of the Missouri Compromise Line, which was a line of latitude that, if it were extended, would cut right through modern California and make it two states. 
Um, that was the sticking point of the compromise in some ways. And Buchanan wanted to extend the, the line, but once he saw that California would be admitted as a state, he eventually and reluctantly agreed to it. And then Cuba. Cuba is his obsession. Um, what's interesting and fascinating and poignant is that Southern slaveholders during this time very often would go to Cuba, sometimes on what we might call a vacation, a holiday, but also to restore their health. And that is where William Rufus King will go as he's dying of tuberculosis. So there's this... I also think a very sentimental connection that Buchanan had to Cuba. He never, he never went his own lifetime, but King did. And between that and the political value of expanding territory for slaveholding Southerners to go and make cotton or, or, or sugar plantations, um, he will push for the acquisition of Cuba well into his presidency, well past the point where there was political support for it. What would James Buchanan have been to be around? What would it have been like? <laughs> um, to put them together for a minute, I would say I call them an odd couple. So if you want to call them the odd couple, you can to get that reference from an older television show. Um, Buchanan was boisterous and outgoing. He was convivial. He enjoyed drinking. He loved Madeira, his favorite wine. Um, he, he Generally, people liked him. There's so many references to how he had a kind of um, likability factor that is hard to quantify why. He was large. He means a larger man, tall. So he, he, was, he sort of had a presence, you might say. Um, he dressed the same way. So he kind of had a signature look. And the cover of the book shows Buchanan in his, his, his standard garb. King could be a bit more reserved at times. He was witty. Um, he was chivalrous and gentlemanly. He had a kind of Southern code of honor about him. He did engage in multiple affairs of honor and, and near duels in his lifetime. But people also found him more effeminate and sometimes bizarre. Um, and so it's sometimes King's effeminacy that gets gossiped and knocked, whereas Buchanan doesn't have that same level of gossip or insult about his appearance and personality. You say in here, King was distinguished because he has the smallest foot of any man in the United States Senate, said one newspaper editor. Well, another complained that he was that flimsiest, tinselly sort of stuff that is intended rather to be admired than handled. Yeah, and those are some great quotes. And of course, who are we quoting? But the opposition party's newspapers. Another important point to make here. Those are people on the other side of the aisle who were trying to deride King's character as he was being considered for the vice presidency. So those two quotes actually come from the time when he was in the national spotlight as a running mate to Franklin Pierce. The, the smallest foot quote, that is a euphemism of sorts. That is, like today, one gets into parts and anatomy and all this, and it's, it's distasteful as, then as it was now. Um, he was at, that, but what's funny is that that quote about the foot was actually attributed to John Randolph from over 40 years ago. And John Randolph was, if anything, the most eccentric man in Congress, who also was known for his odd boots and things. So it's just, it's a case of the pot calling the kettle black. When was it that, that each uh, Buchanan and King started thinking of themselves as presidential or vice presidential material? Yeah. James Buchanan probably thought of himself as a, as a president long before he made active moves towards it. He once he knew that he was doing the, the work of, of Andrew Jackson, he then had a ch probably his first inkling. But when it came into real crystal clear view was Martin Van Buren. Here's a northern man, a Jacksonian, who sort of did his part for the party and was rewarded accordingly. He probably thought to himself, Martin Van Buren will win two terms and I could be the successor. In practice, Van Buren does not win the second term and it throws into confusion the, what would have been a pattern of succession. So it's that first time around in 1844 where Van Buren is thought to be the candidate for, for his third attempt that he puts his, he dips his toe into the water. King actually had entered in a way earlier in 1840, but really from 1840 or 1844, it's each cycle for, for the remainder of their lives that each man will, will want to be president or vice president. And King did become vice president, right. as you said. And he tried um, as much as Buchanan did um, in that there was a time, too, in 1848 where a Buchanan King ticket actually seemed possible. And some of the newspapers in Pennsylvania on their banners would say the bachelor ticket, which I thought was fascinating that, again, it was a kind of moniker that the, Dem the Democratic Party, at least in Pennsylvania, was embracing. And because of Buchanan's influence, King would always be the first choice for vice president of the Pennsylvania delegation 
going into the National Convention, whereas Buchanan would also be the first choice of the Pennsylvania delegation. Alabama similarly returned the favor and would often put Buchanan as its first choice. So they had these two states um, in, their, in, their, in their power, and they used it to their advantage during the various conventions they attempted to win. And he said King was vice president for one month? <laughs> well, let's see, um, six weeks, I want to say, yes. And he took the oath of office in Cuba, and again, he had hoped there to restore his health. He had tuberculosis, for which there was no cure, and he was dying. And his, his slow and um, gradual decline eventually brought him back home to die, and he does die in his home in Selma, Alabama. I have to ask about somebody else in this book, George Dallas. Yeah, George Mifflin Dallas, another Pennsylvanian uh, for whom more credit should be given. He is a vice president of the United States. He was the vice president to James K. Polk. Did it gall Buchanan <laughs> that, that George Dallas got to be vice president? Um, I think Buchanan saw Dallas as, a, as an enemy, as an antagonist within the state, but that the vice presidency was never Buchanan's prize. So in a perverse way, Dallas probably was sidelined by being vice president, and Buchanan was elevated by being secretary of state. So whereas we might say, well, the vice president is the greater prize today, and secretary of state is second, not then. Secretary of state um, was, was a more natural, it was actually for a long time the stepping stone to the presidency, but for Buchanan particularly, it allowed him to, to show his strengths in foreign policy. Um, but what's interesting is that George Dallas wrote to Polk upon Buchanan's selection as Secretary of State that he would resign the vice presidency rather than watch this, his rival uh, come into office. He will eventually walk back from that, but it gives you a sense of how these two men butt heads. And interestingly, every time Buchanan got a position, when he would then step down or move on, it seemed like Dallas would follow him. So the, the, one could write a whole book also about the kind of frenemies that they were between James Buchanan and George Dallas. And J James Buchanan was minister to England for a time? That's right. So minister to Russia in the, in the age of Jackson, minister to England during the presidency of Franklin Pierce. So I, I mentioned that Buchanan was considered for a second time for secretary of state, and that was, again, under Pierce. He definitely did not want the honor. He felt as if his retirement was, was upon him, that uh, being in his early 60s, and that he could gracefully exit the scene. When Pierce appoints him American minister to England, it's debatable whether he'll take it. And he goes to, Buchanan goes through uh, hand-wringing like I've never seen uh, as he tries to justify the whole sequence of events that led him to England. He'll take the position, and in retrospect, he's quite grateful for having done so. He'll serve for three years in England. He'll get more court experience, more foreign policy experience. Um, he will be a favorite of Queen Victoria and her court. But most importantly, he's removed from the contentious domestic politics of the period, particularly the fallout from the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Um, he does have a part in, again, a trying to acquire Cuba through this Ostend Manifesto, but it doesn't seem to hurt him, so that when he does come back to the United States in April 1856, he is, by that time, the front runner to replace Franklin Pierce, who had not said that he wouldn't run again. It's just... Um, in that time, uh, the incumbent was not guaranteed a second term, and in fact, Buchanan had more popular support and will obtain the nomination over Pierce. We, we only have a few minutes left, and we have not talked about James Buchanan's presidency. <laughs> um, first of all, when he became president, what were his goals? What did he want to accomplish? Well, Buchanan wanted to keep the union together, and he was at heart a unionist from his days as Jack's, uh, Jackson's sort of uh, henchman in the Senate. And not a lot had changed. His politics were kind of old. He, he was not dynamic and forward-looking. He didn't have a whole battery of policies or programs. He was truly there to conserve the, the Union. Um, he thought of himself as a conservative. He reacted. He was a reactionary president. He, he responded to events as they unfolded, which gives you a sense of why he's been derided and been called a failure, because he doesn't seem to take action when action was warranted. And yet, at the same time, I think historians are more aware of the fact that his personality was one of stubbornness. He was not vacillating and weak. Instead, he was hard-headed. And a lot of times, his inaction stems from his, his uh, unwillingness to, say, move beyond his constitutional interpretation of the event and essentially to um, move to a place politically where uh, he did not think the party should go. By the time he became president, was secession inevitable? No, and I think historians don't want to use that word inevitable, but 
Why not? Um, it's so hard to say. Is the conflict inevitable? Yes. Was secession during that time inevitable? No. The election of Abraham Lincoln is the direct cause of secession. So in the sense that the Democratic Party fell apart and could not field a unified candidate to oppose Lincoln, then one could say yes. So, I mean, uh, it, Civil War causation gets into a kind of casca cascading events here. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> so I, I don't want to say... I don't want to say it's inevitable so as to sort of disparage Buchanan, but at the same time, um, the conflict was described as irrepressible, and I think that's a nice way to say it. So the southern states started seceding during Buchanan's administration. That's right. How did he react? So Buchanan, as president, in the end of a four-year term, has done much to put himself in the position he's in. I, will, I want to point that out. But at the same time, the southern states did, in fact, secede. He did not, uh, he did not encourage that secession. He actually... Um, spoke against it, but in his annual message, he did come to a constitutional conclusion that the federal government was powerless to prevent it. He was a unionist. He did not want to see the union break apart. And then when delegates from South Carolina, the first state to secede, came to, his, to, to the White House to speak to him, he gave the impression as if he was, it, it, to say it one way, all right with secession. Then, when members of his cabinet from the North came in, he could give the impression that, of course, he was going to oppose it and do all he could to stop it. So that there was uh, a lot of mixed messages coming out of the Buchanan White House at a time when a clear policy was needed. Um, he's, he's, he's described as being too little too late with secession. And indeed, um, when secession becomes a kind of... Um, uh, a real thing, it's, it's already Abraham Lincoln's turn to be president. Lincoln's first month in office is sometimes described as a continuation of Buchanan's almost wait and see policy. It's the firing on Fort Sumter that blows up that policy and essentially makes it untenable. What did Buchanan do during the Civil War? He sat it out. Um, as compared to Franklin Pierce, who at one time appeared on a stage on a July 4th oration as the Battle of Gettysburg is sort of being announced and as Vicksburg is being decided, and deriding the, the United States, James Buchanan never spoke derogatorily in public against the Lincoln administration or against the United States. He was a patriot. Um, he, gave, he gave charitably. He almost uh, um, was a, in direct, a direct line of invasion by the Confederate cavalry. And in fact, um, the Columbia River was the only thing that stood between, sorry, the Columbia Bridge over the Susquehanna River is the only thing that stood between um, Buchanan's home being raided by Confederate cavalry and, uh, and perhaps his own life being taken. The bridge was destroyed to prevent those raiders. And famously, uh, Confederate cavalry got as far north uh, as Harrisburg, almost as Harrisburg, but were, were turned back. So um, Lancaster was spared from, from the raid. But it was actually a real concern. Here's a, a former president who would be a potential target for Confederate raiders. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. We've been speaking to Thomas Belserski. He is the author of this book, Bosom Friends, The Intimate World of James Buchanan and William Rufus King. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details.